It's on the list. I swear. Welcome to Life of an Architect. My name is Tyler, and I'm an architectural designer in California. First off, I want to give credit to ARC20 for this list I'm about to go over. I thought it'd be fun to go through and give my perspective on some of these things since I've done five years of architecture school and now three years working professionally in the office. I'm not going to go through all 250 items on this list, but I am going to go through my top 10 that I can relate with and give some insight on. Make sure to check out the link to the original article in the description box below if you want to see the full list. As a quick disclaimer, I have to state I'm not a licensed architect. I'm a designer at an architecture firm. I'm working on my exams, but I haven't passed them all yet, so I can't legally call myself an architect yet. So don't ask me to design your house. Let's get into this list. So we'll start off with the first one, Building Information Modeling, otherwise known as BIM. So there's a lot more that goes into those than just renderings and VR walkthroughs. So we use certain things like structural models and mechanical models, and we'll integrate those things in our architectural model so we can see conflicts before they happen in the field. So something as simple as a mechanical duct crossing through a structural beam can be identified quickly in the computer before it happens out in the field. How to turn a corner. This is a good one. No, not like that. If you're building drifts like that, you need to fire your structural engineer. In architecture, turning the corner just means how you address the corner condition at the exterior and interior of the building. At the Caltrans District 7 headquarters by Morphosis, the corner is peeled back to reveal the layers of the facade. Mad Architects purposely avoids turning the corner at the exterior of the Harbin Opera House. Prevailing winds. What are prevailing winds? The direction of the prevailing winds is just where the winds are coming from, either north, east, south, west. Here in California, they predominantly come from the northwest. So you'll see us do things like site analysis diagrams on large sites. What we'll do is we'll show where the prevailing winds are coming from in the northwest. Using this information, we might orient the building in a specific way to either block or capture these winds to either bring breezes into the building or maybe block out cold winds in the winter. What went wrong in pruitt Igo? So pruitt Igo is a famous federally funded housing project in St. Louis, Missouri, originally built in 1954. So what does this have to do with architecture? Some architectural modernist ideas that led to the failure of pruitt Igo include the skip-stop elevators, they seem like a great idea because they only stopped at the 1st, 7th, and 10th floors and they encouraged people to try to use the stairs more, but all it did was encourage robberies and muggings in the elevators at those certain floors. On July 15th, 1972, the city of St. Louis demolished three of the total 33 towers of the project. By 1976, the entire complex was demolished. A great documentary called The pruitt Igo Myth was released in 2012 and goes into more detail about this project. So the wages of construction workers. So I'm going to briefly go over prevailing wage versus non-prevailing wage. In government contracting, a prevailing wage is defined as the hourly wage and benefits paid to the majority of workers, laborers, and mechanics within a particular area. Prevailing wages are established by regulatory agencies for each trade or occupation that's involved in a public works project. Workers paid prevailing wage make approximately 50% more in wages and benefits. Another reason to know the wages of construction workers is to know which trades are gonna be on the job. So a mason laying brick on the project is gonna be a different hourly wage than someone that's framing the walls or hanging the sheetrock. Don't even get me started on welders. We try to avoid bringing welders on the site because on-site labor increases the cost substantially. The feel of cool marble under bare feet. Besides that, I think this one is referring to the need for architects to understand the feel of different materials on a perceptual level. Surfaces that we know people will be coming in close contact with will usually be given greater care and specified as higher quality materials. Throughout my office here, we use this wood in an unconventional way as a wall finish. 
it gives a much different feel to the space and it makes it kind of nicer to work in actually. So where your materials come from? Well, this is an important one to know for multiple reasons. So say you specify this really nice Italian marble straight from Italy. Well, not only is that really expensive, but it takes a lot of energy to make that material and ship it all the way over here. It's not sustainable. Another reason is for timing. So say for example, you want this really specific species of wood and it's really far away from you. Well, it's gonna take a long time for that wood to get here. You could specify a different species of wood that's more local to your area, then you'd save time and money, possibly support a local business. So since it's somewhat of an art, architects use various types of artistic media to represent their designs. This can be anything from those hyper-realistic renderings that you see, all the way down to the fuzzy sketch on the back of a napkin. I'm not kidding, a napkin sketch is a real thing. Everything in between can be watercolor paintings, sketch models, 3D models, whatever you want. There's almost no limits to representing an architectural idea. This might be a funny one to some people that think, concrete's just concrete, right? No, not really. You got the trowel finish, the broom finish, the exposed aggregate, polished concrete. We'll use different types of concrete finishes in different areas. So like the broom finish, for example, is just a troweled finish taken to the next level. It's good for providing traction in areas that could get slippery when wet. So the golden ratio is nothing more than a line segment that's cut in two pieces of different lengths, such that the ratio of the whole segment to that of the longer segment is equal to the ratio of the longer segment to the shorter segment. The simple way to define that is the ratio of the longer line to the shorter line is equal to 1.618. This proportion and ratio shows up in a lot of places in nature, particularly in snail shells, galaxies, and even memes. You are fake news. I want to go over a funny honorable mention that I saw on this list. How to live in a small room with five strangers for six months. What I think this is highlighting is the need for architects to be conscious about the usefulness of space. This is actually a really cool and niche study in architecture that uses sliding walls and creative ways to live in small spaces. This apartment in Japan and many others like it make use of every square inch of small space. And my favorite one of all, good beer. I'm not kidding, it's number 129 on the list. Go look for yourself. But seriously, young architects and architecture students love a good beer. Especially a nice cold one to make you forget that the client just told you to redesign the project. Or your instructor tells you to redesign after a harsh midterm review. Either way, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Let me know in the comments below if there's anything else you think that should have been included here. And don't forget to check out the full list from ARC20 in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.